Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Severo Institute. My name is Josef Schima. I'm president of this small, cute, private university. And I'll, I'll be your guide through today's debate. Um, let me first mention for those of you who are here for the first time where, where you are. Um, this school is a relatively young one. It's, it has been started some nine years ago. At the moment, it has almost 1,000 students offering BA and MA programs in economic policy, political science and international relations, law in business and public administration and security studies as well. Um, we believe we are a unique institution, unique in the sense that we believe in having a small successful school. A school where professors know their students and students know their professors. That when we teach students we actually know them by name. And we strongly believe that our students like to enjoy the activities outside of classrooms as well. And this debate of the day is an example of it. We believe that when we can best teach our students uh, in a way when we bring to the school um, people of excellence, people who are successful in what they do. And indeed today we have two great speakers and two great guests who are very good in what they do, namely monetary policy. Um, and indeed this is not first event devoted to monetary policy. Uh, two months ago we had here a leading European monetary scholar, Professor White, who was member of the executive board of the Bank for International Settlement, and he debated here with the vice president of the vice governor of the Czech National Bank, Dr. Hampel. Um, a few weeks ago, we had a former governor of the Czech Center Bank, uh, Dr. Tuma, debating Greece and the Grexit question. And in a week, we have a joint project, Severo Institute and the Czech Central Bank, Czech National Bank, uh, a debate devoted to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and the impact of new technologies for conducting monetary policy. And indeed, among our publications, you will find uh, several uh, studies, both in Czech and English, devoted to the problem of euro, to the problem of debts, and to the, to the general problem of uh, proper monetary and also fiscal policy. Well, as for today, we'll start with two presentations of our guests. And then, hopefully, we will have a long Q&A session because that is, I believe, what you came for, so that you will have a chance to ask questions and our guests will respond uh, to those questions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now invite to the floor Professor Vladimir Tomšík, Vice Governor of the Czech National Bank, who is a dear colleague and friend of mine, and he will give us his view on the prospects of the Eurozone and the Banking Union in particular. Vladio, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. Thank you very much for a very nice invitation to be present here. And it was said that there are three professors in economics, finance, and 
Right, why I'm here, I'm not here as an economist right now, I'm here just because I'm responsible for financial supervision, for financial stability and Czech National Bank. And the key topic that we have chosen for this evening is banking union. I think that all of us, maybe we are already a little bit tired regarding the discussions of the Eurozone, when and whether we should join the Eurozone. But now we do have another issue when or whether we should join banking union. So and I, I'm, I'm very pleased to start the discussions regarding the financial stability and the supervision and, and the discussion regarding the banking union. And I will just present what's the official stance of the Czech National Bank regarding the banking union. And I will be very pleased that I will be followed by Professor Andreas Dombert, who is also responsible for financial supervision uh, in Germany at Bundesbank. So what, the, what I would like to talk, what I would like to focus on, first of all, let me, let me briefly say what is the key element of the financial sector in the Czech Republic. And I think nobody should be surprised that, I mean, Czech people are very conservative and, I mean, almost all deposits are put in banks. So banking sector is really a key element for the whole financial sector in the Czech Republic. And this is very important, so we have to be very cautious of what's going on regarding the regulation, what's going on regarding the supervision, and especially the balance between responsibilities, powers, and if there's something wrong regarding cost sharing, burden sharing with the banking sector. So are we ready to really say that our banking, that our banking sector is really stable, well capitalized, and prepared for any future shocks. And I'm very happy that I can say, if you look at our capital requirements, it seems to me they are really quite significant. We don't talk about the minimum requirement about 8%. Or well, now, if you look at Basel III, which is, I mean, 8% plus conservative buffers, 2.5. It should be more than 10.5%. If we are looking at our banking sector, we are talking about the banking requirements and banking capitalizations about 16, 17 percent. And what is really important that our banking sector is very well capitalized based on core equity tier capital. So this is real capital that if there is anything wrong, we can immediately use to protect using public money to save banking sector. And what is really important that this is not something as absolutely new. The capitalization of the banking sector has been quite stable even during the whole financial period, crisis, during the whole banking crisis in the last four or five years. The same holds for the liquidity measures. I'm very pleased that I can say, well, the Czech banking sector hasn't any problem to get liquidity and to, return to, I would say, create profits, even during, even during the financial crisis. And I started my presentations very, I would say, short presentations that our banking sector is a really key element for the whole financial sector. Why? Because if you look at the deposit to loan ratio, is more than 100%. That's why we are really very cautious of what's going on in banking sector and what kind of powers we do have to protect our depositors. Okay, you can say, so far so good, but are you really prepared if there is something wrong for the future? How will you be able to cope with the future situations? And my answer would be that that's the reason that we started to run stress tests more than eight or 10 years ago. And now I can present only the latest results of stress test, which was run in 2014, because the, we updated every year we run stress test, and the next stress test, I mean, based on 2015, data will be published next week. So I'm not, I mean, allowed to publish it right now. But if you look at the latest results, definitely, I'm very pleased I can say our banking sector is ready and to, I would say, survive even very negative scenario based on our own stress test. What it means to survive, it means that even if there is a really sudden shock and very huge shock, still there is a really a huge buffer 
that the capital wouldn't go below 8%, which is really, I would say, very significant according to regulation. Nevertheless, there is a new idea on the table. Even if your banking sector is really stable and public money hasn't been used during the latest crisis to provide liquidity, to provide capital in the banking sector, wouldn't it be very attractive to join the bigger family, which we, call, which we can call as a banking union? And first of all, I have to say, if we say, okay, if someone wants to join it, it means to send powers to decide about our capital requirements, about some other supervisory authority powers somewhere else. Fair enough. If someone wants to do that, go ahead. But I would also would like to hear what about the responsibilities and costs, especially in a bad times. So right now I'm saying, okay, we are responsible for that. And if we fail as a national supervisor, yeah, we know about that failure. It can happen. It's going to be our Ministry of Finance who will pay for that, or our single resolution mechanism which will pay for that. I'm just afraid if we join banking union, we will lose some powers, and that's the questions who will pay for that. And definitely, I'm looking forward to discussion about that. So, if I look at the situations in eurozone right now. Fair enough, as an economist, I can say it makes sense once you do have one single market, one single currency. It means you do have one monetary policy. You do have one lender of last resort. And at the same time, you do have one single supervision. You do have one single resolution fund. Well, it makes sense to have one single banking union. But still, I'm pretty sure if we see there is not enough money for a single resolution mechanism, you need to have some other backstops. And probably you should have some single Ministry of Finance in Eurozone. That's why I have written, probably for the future, we should think about some single fiscal policy. But I look at it as an economist. You should ask yourself, as a member of the European Union, you would vote for that to have one single, I would say, fiscal union, one single taxes. Just think about it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we do not have optimal currency area. Well, on one hand, as I said, I fully understand it makes sense to have a banking union if you don't, I would say, believe, if you believe there is some home bias regarding the national supervisory authorities, regarding the supervisory policy, or regarding the regulation policy. But once we are talking about regulation, and regulation and supervision is something different. Once we are talking about regulation, I'm pretty sure that we do have one single regulation body in the European Union which is mostly represented by European Commission, because European Commission, I mean, prepares and implements requirements and directives. We do have, regarding the whole banking market, we call it as a European Banking Authority, which issues legal binding, I would say, some guidelines, etc. But what is very important, we, so far we haven't had one single supervisory body. And I fully understand what you do have one common monetary policy for 19 countries, right now for 19 countries, and completely different 19 supervisory authorities, well, you should really do some harmonization. But so far, Czech Republic has always advocated just provide some minimum standards. And that should be really harmonized, to provide some minimum standards. If someone wants to be more prudent and to address some national differences, allow them, and to be more prudent, allow them to increase levels. And, and I'm very pleased that we do have Andreas Dombrer here, who is a member of the Basel Committee, and Basel Committee is an international body providing international standards regarding the regulation for the whole international world. And I think it was always advocated 
that we should have some at least minimum level of capital requirements like 8% plus some conservatives, etc. But if someone wants to have more capital like 12%, 15 just let them have this capital. Why not? And regarding the another advocation of banking union, and I fully believe I fully believe that it makes sense to do something to interrupt the wishes circle between banks buying government bonds and governments just issuing the bonds and I mean spending money. This is really wishes circle. And how we can interrupt it? Very easily. You see, there is a national bias to buy national government bonds, which is, by the way, I mean, treated as uh, risk-free according to European legislation, not according to Basel Committee, but according to European legislation. Well, and you do have a national supervisory authority which say that's that's fair enough, just do it. So there should be some international body to interrupt it. But this is something would definitely fit to the Eurozone, because as I said, you do have one monetary policy. That's the question, we, do, we should do that also in the Czech Republic. Finally, let me see that so far we have publicly, I mean, advocated it, we have discussed it, and I'm very pleased that so far the Czech Republic has decided to have wait and see approach. It simply means that we haven't said we will not join the bank union for the future. But right now, we don't see a really uh, more advantages than disadvantages. Finally, and you know that, that almost all, and I'm calling as a Czech banks, they are operated as subsidiaries in the Czech Republic, but the owners are foreigners. Headquarters are abroad. And some people, they say, well, Czech National Bank, you don't want to be a part of the whole decision banking body and to see what's going on in the whole financial groups. You just supervise with the local subsidiaries. Aren't you interested in what's going on in the whole financial groups in headquarters? I say, yes, I am very much interested. I want to know what's going on regarding the capital requirements in headquarters regarding the liquidity. But I do have some powers to do that, and we call it as a international colleges. International colleges, it means that all national supervisor bodies, they sit together, they share information, and they also share some, I mean, requirements according to local capital, local liquidity. We call it as a joint risk assessment decision process. This is very attractive. And so far, once we are as an independent supervisory body, we do have a power to vote on it. If you do have just as a branch, or if you are a member of the bigger family as a banking union, you will be sitting in the colleges again, but without any power. This is the truth. So that's why so far we are a full-fledged member of the colleges. So we do have some, I would say, procedures, how to share information, how to work together, but as I said, as far as we see that we do have responsibilities, we want to have some powers, and we want to see who is the final beneficiary, who is the final, I would say even, person who will cover the bill if there is something wrong. So let me, I would say, conclude that it makes sense to have a banking union once you, a member of a single currency area, but it's not a optimal currency area. And I do have just three questions for Mr. Adamsmer because I will say just to start the discussions and I definitely will be happy to have a discussions. So I'm just wondering, even if you create international supervisory body, which we can call as a single supervisory mechanism, which is now represented by, I mean, as a sitting in Frankfurt, part of the ECB, still, there still will be some national discrepancies, national, I would say, special features of all financial sectors. 
And the single supervisory mechanism supervises only the most important banks, the biggest bank, I would say. So still, how do you want to address the home bias once you don't supervise all banks, all, I would say, credit unions, etc.? So it, it's a really long-run process to address the home bias, and I'm wondering how we can cope with that. And probably the final question, how to mitigate some risk regarding the regulatory and supervisory requirements, as I said. We do have one single international body addressing requirements, for example, Basel Committee or European Commission, EBA. But still, we are still running and having national supervisory bodies. So let me finish with those questions and I'm looking forward to have a discussion at the end of all presentations. But still, if you don't have enough time for discussions, you can always send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir, for your remarks. Now, without further delays, I'd like to uh, call to the podium Dr. Andreas Dombret, member of the executive board of Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, to give his introductory remarks. And thank you, Professor, for coming to Severo Institute. Dear Chairman, Professor Chima, dear Vladimir, ladies and gentlemen, it's a big honor to be invited here tonight at this institute where professors know their students and students know their professors. I have listened to you to the impressive program of speakers who have been here and uh, the debate you are fostering. So it is a pleasure and you all honor me with your presence and of course also Vladimir uh, and your interest in the topic. Let me go right into the topic. Since the treaties of Rome were concluded in 1957, the history of Europe has been marked by an ever deepening, deepening integration. But to some degree, this process has certainly been driven by the idea that in a globalized world, only a united and a strong Europe can actually succeed. In 1954, Jean Monnet, the French statesman and one of the founding fathers of the European Union, said, and I would like to quote Jean Monnet, our countries have become too small for today's world when compared to the potential of modern technical means and in relation, and in relation to the dimension of America and Russia today, China and India tomorrow." End of quote. Now, in that sense, European integration and also the introduction of the euro could be interpreted as a response to globalization, as an attempt to create a strong, rational pole in an increasingly multipolar world. Now, from an economic point of view, this process of integration culminated in the introduction of the euro in 1999. In that year, in 1999, actually Europe took a historic step towards deeper financial integration. However, as you all know, it may have been historic, but it was also controversial. Now, many critics at the time argued that Europe was not yet an optimal currency area and therefore that Europe would not be ready for a single currency. In their, as they call it, coronation theory, coronation theory, the creation of a single currency should be the coronation of a long-term process of political and economic convergence, not the precondition for it. In contrast to that view, 
proponents, proponents of the euro propagated the locomotive theory, uh, whereby a single currency would be introduced early on and would act sort of as a locomotive for further economic and political integration. Eventually, as we all know, the proponents of the locomotive theory prevailed and the euro was introduced in 1999 and for the first 10 years of its existence the euro proved to be a stable, I should even say very stable currency. Then in the wake of the uh, global financial crisis of 2007-2008 the euro area actually slid in to a financial crisis of its own. This was compounded in 2010 when Greece entered into a sovereign debt crisis, leading to other member states of the euro area suffering a sudden loss in confidence, which eventually brought the euro area to the brink of collapse. Now, extensive rescue packages by the governments of the euro area alongside with what we call non-standard measures taken by the European Central Bank and by the Euro system helped calm the markets and actually prevented the crisis uh, from escalating. Now to some commentators the current situation might look very similar. Greece's newly elected government objected to complying with the financial assistance agreements and intended to withdraw some of the reforms Greece had already been adopted before. And there were even brief calls for further debt relief by Greece. And over the last few weeks, I have to say the situation in Greece has not improved. Rather, it is obvious that the financing problems in Greece are increasing further. How much longer exactly Greece's financial resources will last is um, hard to say. But it seems fair to say that time is running out for Greece. Further financial help would certainly buy time, as it has done before. However, it cannot remedy the lack of competition and competitiveness, I would rather say, the lack of competitiveness of Greece or establish a functioning administrative structure. Only the Greek government can undertake the reforms which are necessary in Greece. Therefore, further assistance can only be granted if Greece continues with its efforts to restore sound public finances and competitive economic structures. To, re to regain the trust of the investors, sustainability and competitiveness are necessary requirements. Now some observers see these developments as an indication that financial integration in Europe has failed. To some of them, all their original ideas are becoming true. I see these developments as an indication that financial integration in Europe has to go even further. And I would like, together with you, take a look at three areas where further integration could, could be the way forward. And as I see some of you listening um, with the translation, I'm speaking slowly rather than quickly, that everybody can follow. So the first area of further integration, I think, is public finances. Now, in order to understand the core of my argument, it's important to be familiar with the particular features of the European Monetary Union. Now, the European Monetary Union is special in that it combines a single monetary policy with national fiscal policies. Now, the monetary policy for the 19 member states of the euro area is decided by the governing council of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. However, the fiscal policies of the 19 euro area member states are a matter for the national policymakers. 
As you know, each country in the euro area decides on its own government revenue and expenditure. Now, this imbalance of responsibilities, this imbalance of responsibilities gives individual countries an incentive to borrow. Uh, and the economists amongst us would call this a deficit bias. And this deficit bias is built into the system of the euro area. This is because the negative consequences of borrowing are spread across all the member states of the monetary union, for example, by means of a higher interest rate level for all of them when they're borrowing. Our objective, therefore, in the euro area should be and has to be to counter the deficit bias to ensure a stable monetary union. And this can only be achieved by realigning responsibilities. An economist would say liability and control have to be in balance, have to be in an equilibrium. And one way to rebalance liability and control is deeper fiscal integration. If we were to take this path, the European level would gain certain control rights over national budgets. Now, Vladimir talked about a fiscal, a fiscal union. And this is exactly what it would mean. This would amount to what is known as a fiscal union. However, such a step would depend on the countries of the euro area transferring national sovereignty to the European level. Now, giving up sovereignty in this way would be rather a radical change for the euro area, and it would, requi would require wide-ranging changes to national legislation and also to European legislation. And more than anything, such changes would need not only the support of policymakers, i.e. parliaments or governments, but I, I'm convinced it would also need the support of the general public. And on this point, I think we need to be realistic. I cannot identify any willingness to, deal, to, do, to give up uh, sovereignty um, in the euro area about the budget, neither in Germany nor in any other country of the euro area. So I'm not saying what I'm wishing for, but I'm urging to be realistic. And this means, if I am correct, that for the foreseeable future, the control of fiscal policy in Europe will remain at the national level, will remain with the countries. And in this area, in the area of fiscal integration, deeper integration, I argue, still lies beyond the horizon. But at this point in time, a fiscal union, as I said, remains more of a vision than a concrete step to be taken anytime soon. Now, however, in another area, and Vladimir talked about it, Europe has just taken a significant step towards deeper integration. On November 4th of last year, the European Central Bank assumed direct supervision of the largest banks in the euro area, thereby creating the first pillar of what we call a European Banking Union. Now, as of today, and I'm a member of the supervisory board of this, this concerns 123 banks out of 3,400 banks in the euro area. So you will think this is a small number of banks. But these 123 banks together account for more than 80% of the aggregate balance sheet of the euro area's banking sector. So it's very significant. The European Central Bank has therefore become one of the world's largest bank supervisors practically overnight. The Bundesbank is not a small institution, but we are tiny vis-a-vis -vis the ECB and its bank supervision. And now we are a smaller part in a very relevant bank supervisor before we were a medium-sized but not so relevant institution. The banking union, just to make this very clear to all of you, please, is, in my opinion, the single biggest step towards financial integration in Europe 
since the launch of the common currency, the euro, the euro area has taken. So you have to put this into perspective and value this as a very, very serious step. And it's not only the single most important, it is all the most, also the most logical step to me. Single monetary policy require, requires integrated financial markets, and that includes, without any doubt, integrated financial markets include European level banking supervision. European banking supervision allows banks throughout the entire euro area to be supervised according to the same high standards. In addition, cross-border effects can be covered much better through joint supervision than it can be covered by national supervisors. And I have Dexia as an example. I can throw in hypo real estate. Several cross-border examples come to mind which would have been solved much better if we would have had already the European supervision. And adding, and that's a very important point to me, adding a European perspective to the national view puts more distance between the supervisory authority and the entities it supervises. It makes the supervisor much more neutral. And this minimizes the danger of supervisors getting all too close to their banks and treating them much nicer than they would normally do um, out of national interest, which is never good for bank supervision. Meanwhile, a comprehensive banking union has to comprise more than just an effective European banking supervision. A second pillar of the banking union is a European resolution mechanism to deal with future bank failures, of which I hope we have as little as possible, of course. This mechanism, the resolution mechanism, will be in place from the 1st of January uh, of next year onwards. The Germans have, just to make sure we are ahead, have already put it into place at the beginning of this year. If push comes to shove and a bank is no longer viable, shareholders and creditors will now be first in line to bear the losses of the banks and taxpayers' money will only be the very last resort. And this will realign incentives and this will make the entire banking system more stable. Now the European Banking Union is definitely, at least I think, a major step forward in designing a better framework for the European Monetary Union. However, as important as banks are, Europe should broaden its view beyond the banking sector. Now, consequently, the EU Commission has proposed to establish a European Capital Markets Union. So you see the logic of my speech going from monetary union over fiscal union over banking union to a capital markets union. Following monetary union and the banking union, this will be the third major step to financial integration in Europe. Now, in essence, the European Capital Markets Union has two objectives. The first objective is to increase the share of capital markets in the funding mix of the real economy. And the second objective is to integrate capital markets more closely across borders. Now, some people relate the first objective to the question of whether a capital market-based financial system like the one we have in the United States or in the United Kingdom, is superior to a bank-based financial system like the one we have in Germany or in the Czech Republic. So which system is superior, a capital market-based or a bank-based system? Well, to sum up the empirical evidence, typical economic answer, it depends. It depends on a number of factors and on a number of country-specific characteristics, which actually makes it hard to provide a general answer. Nevertheless, the recent crisis did shed light on these issues from another angle, which I would like to concentrate on. A system in which the real economy, in which all the corporations rely on a single source of funding will most certainly run into trouble 
when that source dries up, regardless of whether it is a bank-based or a capital market-based funding system. Therefore, to me, the question is not a question of either or. The objective of the European Capital Markets Union is not to get rid of bank-based financing, not to abandon uh, bank-based funding, but to supplement it with capital market-based funding, in addition to what we already have. And in Europe, above all places, there is ample room to supplement uh, bank-based funding. The, the European stock market, and I'm looking at the EU28, including your country, is only 60% of the size of the US stock market when measured in relation to GDP. Likewise, the European market for venture capital is 20% of the size of the United States, and for securitization, the percentage is even lower than 20%. In the end, it comes down to the uncontested argument of diversification. Increasing the share of capital markets will improve and will broaden access to funding. By the way, particularly for small and medium enterprises, medium-sized enterprises for the SMEs, which form the backbone of many European countries, including, including yours and including mine. At the same time, a capital markets union will improve the matching of investors to financial risk, thereby increasing the efficiency of the financial system. As a result, the financial system will be able to better support sustainable economic growth, which we care about. The second objective of the European Capital Markets Union is to improve the integration of capital markets in the entire European Union. One of the main arguments is that integrated capital markets can improve private risk sharing. The technical question is to what degree does a shock to the economy affect consumption? Empirical studies for the United States show that integrated capital markets cushion around 40% of the cyclical fluctuations among the United States federal states, amongst the 50 states. 40% of these cyclical fluctuations are cushioned. A share of around 25% is smoothed via the credit markets, while fiscal policy cushion 10 to 20% of shocks. Altogether, around 80% of a given economic shock in the United States is absorbed before it can affect consumption. Studies for Canada yield similar results, and actually, Studies for Sweden do the same. So it's not only a big country, but also a smaller country phenomenon. Now in Europe, the picture looks very, very different. Here, it is mainly credit markets that cushion economic shocks, and they are not very effective in doing so, I'm afraid. Altogether, only about 40% of a given shock is absorbed before it can affect consumption. Now, increasing the share of capital markets and integrating them across border would therefore help improve risk sharing in Europe and reduce the volatility of consumption. To be sure, the argument for a capital markets union is straightforward, easy to make the argument for a capital markets union, but implementation is much less straightforward than the argument. The Capital Markets Union is a complex undertaking affecting many, many different areas. Consequently, the European Commission has presented a wide range of suggestions and steps to be taken. Nevertheless, I firmly believe that Europe should embark on the path towards a Capital Markets Union in order to enhance the stability and the prosperity of our economy. Ladies and gentlemen, let me come to the end. George Washington is credited with having written 
more than, listen to me, more than two, cent uh, two centuries ago, more than 200 years ago, in a letter to a friend that a United States of Europe would come into being. Many other politicians, including Winston Churchill, repeated that idea. Now this is certainly a very bold vision, a United States of Europe, aiming at an encompassing political integration. In my little intervention tonight, I have taken a much more modest approach and only argued from an economic point of view, not from a political point of view. I have tried to highlight three areas where deeper integration may help enhance the stability of the monetary union. The first area is public finances. Although, as I mentioned, a European fiscal union is currently a rather unrealistic vision. The second area I mentioned is the banking system. Vladimir talked about that. And here we have taken a major step towards integration. As you know, on November 4th, the banking union actually became a reality. And the third area, I believe, is the capital markets. Uh, looking to the future, I consider a capital markets union another important project that would contribute to enhancing the stability of the European economy. Now, to be sure, all these are very big steps, but in my view, they are worth taking. A stable monetary union in the euro area will eventually benefit all member states and also the rest of the world, including the Czech Republic. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Professor, very much for your remarks. And now the floor is open for questions. Um, however, before the first question will be asked, I'd like to thank uh, the Alliance of European Reformists and Conservatives for supporting this event. Okay, now questions. Okay. All right, so we have one and two. So first row, Dr. Vondra. Uh, I have no doubts uh, that uh, the Germans were supporting the banking union because it gives them the control power. But uh, regarding uh, the uh, capital market union, uh, do you believe that you would uh, teach the Germans to uh, go for a more risky capital market than to the banks for the money? Should I answer directly? Sure, please do. What do I do to answer this? No, I think it's on. It's on. No, thank you for that question. First of all, joining the banking union is much more controversial than you think. Um, don't forget that Germany is handing over, like in the case of the Deutschmark vis-à-vis -vis the euro, um, the direct power of supervision over our major banks, 21 largest banking groups, to the ECB. That was, that's not uncontroversial. And um, I, I'm the chief bank supervisor of Germany. I was in charge. I'm no longer in charge. I'm now part of a group of people. I have a say and I have a vote. So I'm giving up direct control over the heart of our financial system. So I would not think we get a lot of power what we get is, and I think that's a fair, a fair deal, so to say, if I may say that, whilst we give up power on the one hand, we are receiving information and indirect control over 101 other banks. So while we now have Italians and French people and Spaniards or whoever doing research on Deutsche Bank, we now have people in Italy, France, and Spain looking at whatever, Santander, uh, Unicredit, and BNP Paribas. 
And that to me is sort of an equilibrium of giving something up and getting something if you want the EU area to be successful. And if a fiscal union is not a realistic medium-term goal, you have to go to deeper integration and integrated financial markets make it necessary to go that step. But it's not about more power. We are now one cook out of 19 in a, in a, in a, in a new kitchen. And we have to see how this works, but we really would like to make it work. Now, with regard to the capital markets union, I get even more criticism because the savings banks of Germany and the cooperative banks of Germany, which are entirely lending based and don't have access to the capital markets and don't use capital markets in their, in their offering, they see a capital markets union as a threat to their business model. But that doesn't mean, as an independent central banker, that I would not argue the way I just did. For me, the efficiency argument of risk sharing and uh, is, is a very important one. And again, I, I argue from a macro perspective where I say if you have a single source of funding, it's much better to stand on two legs than on one because no matter which system is superior, I don't want to be entirely dependent on one system. So it's a, uh, the argument, as I did put forward, is one to complement what we already have, rather than to give it up and exchange it against something new. But this is not an easy discussion to have, but at least we were able, or I was able, to convince um, a big part of the German banking sector to think through that it not only has negatives but also some positives. But I'm, 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 I'm surely convinced that there is not one solution or one system, whether bank-based or capital market-based, which is the right thing, but that we have to be open to both aspects of, of capital markets. Now, there are some lower-hanging fruits which we have to go after. A very low-hanging fruit, from my perspective, I think it also holds true for your economy, is to harmonize transparent and simple securitization. That is something where we should start. Another low-hanging fruit would be, do we have to have different criteria for IPO prospectuses in all 28 better states? Of course, that is not a logical thing to have. There are other, to give the other side, you know, there are other aspects which are much more difficult to get to. One would be, do we need 28 different solvency systems or insolvency laws? Now, any insolvency lawyer in the room would argue yes, because I make a lot of money from insolvency law. But I would argue it would make, I would not mind having, uh, you know, trying to have one insolvency law and uh, everybody knows uh, um, what's going on. What I would love, if I would have a free wish, it would be to also to some extent, and I'll mention it, harmonize the tax systems. We have, for example, a big bias in our European bank, in our tax system, towards debt. Because you can use it, you know, uh, the, the losses, or you know, the, 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 uh, you can deduct the interest from your revenues. And you have a big bias of debt versus equity. A big bias out of tax. To take this bias away would, of course, make the entire capital markets more active and more stable because you would have equity. Um, will, you know, the, the way equity works is if you lose, the equity will go down. But if you lose the debt, the debt will default. So you have a bigger buffer, in, of course, in the equity markets than in the debt markets. Will that happen very soon? Of course not. There's going to be a lot of interest. So there are some lower hanging fruit in the capital markets. If we get them, and if we do that right, we have a good chance of convincing others. If we start with the very, very complex, difficult issues, it can take us forever to get to anything, and then the interest will be lost in the capital markets. Union. All right, Vladimir. 
if I can elaborate a bit more and provide some comments from the Czech perspective on this on these questions. And especially I would like to I mean say some words regarding what just said regarding that it was not easy for Bundesbank to give up national powers and responsibilities and to send it to ECB. And you said that there was something I would call it as a trade that you are going to give up the responsibilities and powers and you will get some more information and probably some influence on what's going on in the whole international financial groups operating in, in Italy or in the whole Eurozone. This is something where I fully understand and you clearly said yeah it was necessary to make Euro to be successful. And I fully I fully support this idea because you do have one single currency and ECB is a lender of last resort. So definitely it's very difficult to say that you are going to have a stable national currency if there is a problem in some part of the Eurozone, for example, Italy, Portugal, Greece, etc. So definitely I understand that that is something is a fair deal to send responsibilities power to somewhere else and to get information on what's going on in the other parts of the Eurozone. And this is the this is absolutely a key element for, I would say, Czech financial sector and the Czech national bank that so far we don't see it as attractive really to, to feel, to get some powers to influence what's going on in Italy or somewhere else because we have national currency. So I'm saying that once we are responsible for national currency, for national financial stability, for national depository guarantee scheme, so we don't see as a fair deal to send responsibilities powers to Frankfurt and just to see and to think that we are going to have some powers what's going on in the etc. So as I said, we are so far very pleased that once we are responsible for national subsidiaries that we at least we know what's going on in the financial groups regarding within the colleges. We do have powers to say what should be the appropriate capital for national subsidiaries based on joint risk assessment process. And I don't see as a fair deal to exchange what you just said. But I said the key element is whether we are a member of, I mean, single currency union or not. So as an economist, I fully understand. And from the national perspective, this is something what we, that's, that's the reason that we have advocated to see or to have wait and see approach. Just to clarify it. See, by the way, so, <laughs> that's pretty. I guess, <laughs> but that's you know, this is. I, I see your checkpoint. I'm, I can only uh, explain it from our point, and there is no right or wrong. It's always good to have choices, I guess. And uh, mm -hmm. we would, we like, we think from a German perspective, having exchanged the Deutsche Mark against the Euro and having exchanged our own direct powers and bank supervision to be part of a bigger group, that this is. On balance, good for us, and uh, uh, um, and uh, everybody and each country is independent and sovereign enough to make its own uh, suggestion. And I didn't come here to to advertise. <laughs> okay, Mr. President Poyar. Uh, I will test uh, uh, your differences if they are in how deep. What are your comments, both of you, on the decision of the Greek court on the illegality of cutting the pensions? Of the, e of the Greek court, which ruled that it was illegal to cut the pensions and they have to put the pensions back onto the, on the same level as they used to be before the austerity, two days ago, yesterday, or three days ago. Yeah. What, what, what it means, I'm, I'm, and what, what is the view from Frankfurt and Prague? Shall I, shall I start? Um, <laughs> Please. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not interfering in court decisions. Uh, and, uh, and I respect courts. Uh, we also had decisions of the Constitutional Court in Portugal. Uh, it's not only a Greek issue in this degree. But there is no doubt in my mind that Greece has to do minimum three things. They need to build up a functioning administration. They need to make sure that their public finances are sound over time and they need to enhance the competitiveness of its economy. 
and uh, uh, for me that is a minimum a minimum what you need in order to be uh, um, to be able to access capital markets and to fund yourself so uh, how this is done and what roles the court play is not for me to comment on I respect the courts I mean, both of us, we are central bankers, and central, bank, central bankers, they do not comment on I mean, fiscal policy, they do not comment uh, the decision made by, by court, so definitely we are on the, same, on the same boat, and I would say just this is not my business. But nevertheless, what I would like to say, and, and just I'm going to quote what was said by Andras in his speech, that definitely what is really important for, I mean, all countries, not only for Greece, to restore trust to investors, definitely. And it was just clearly described that you see at least three basic elements, how to restore it regarding the public finance administration, etc. I, I just want to probably think as an economist to, in some other things, some people they say definitely that Greece should go in a internal, I would say, long process of, I would say, cutting public expenditures, uh, internal devaluation, etc. because once they are a member of the Eurozone, they can't go for external devaluation, etc. And some other economists, they say, no, they should exit, and they should go for, I mean, devaluation. But I just want to say there is no free lunch. Even if you think about, I mean, exit from the Eurozone, what can you expect for the future? You, are going, you will have to introduce your own currency, if you introduce your own currency, what well, you can expect? You can expect immediately a huge devaluation to start, I mean, competitiveness. Because the debt is still in euro. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, exactly. So it seems to me, I mean, both ways would be very costly. And it's really in hands of the whole economic policy in a political discussions, in a negotiations. But they have to do everything to restore confidence, to restore trust for investors, because this is the only way how you can start to make your economy competitive for the future. And I think that Andras has already provided these three comments how to, do, how to start. It's a, but I, you know, your question is still a very valid question, because the complexity of the problem in Greece is very, very high. and. Uh, uh, they are a member of the Eurozone, they are a member of the European Union, and of course there is an inclination to help them as much as possible yeah. out of European solidarity. Um, but to go away from the principle of lending money against conditions with a conditionality, I think that's impossible to go that route. Um, uh, a conditionality needs to be in place, which one which is controllable and one you can oversee. Otherwise, um, that that is uh, that would uh, violate all rules of the International Monetar Monetary Fund. Um, if any banker in the room would do that with his or her client. Vladimir would go after the banker because uh, the banker would violate uh, 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 basic banking exactly. principles. I hope we find a solution for Greece, but it has to work for all sides. All right, we have a question at the back. Professor Bogdan Glavan, a research fellow from Romanian American University, Bucharest. I uh, have uh, one comment and one question if I'm allowed to make one a uh, bit longer comment. I will start with it. Uh, the two distinguished speakers have mentioned repeatedly concepts like uh, financial stability and union, monetary union, banking union, and um, fiscal union. I would like to emphasize that neither of the two concepts are very useful uh, in themselves. For instance, uh, financial stability. In Romania, as well as in the Czech Republic, we had half a century of financial stability under communism. Uh, Zimbabwe, until five years ago, had a banking union, was an optimal currency area, and had a single fiscal authority. And neither of these facts 
prevented it from falling into financial and hyperinflationary collapse. So I think what is at stake here is how can we have a quality, sound financial and monetary system? Uh, and when we think about these issues and uh, confront concepts like financial stability with reality, we can make comparisons between various industries or fields, for instance, the industry of beer. We don't have in the industry of beer a financial uh, stability authority. I mean, nobody is concerned if a brewer goes into bankruptcy. Uh, be why? Because we know, that for, we know for centuries that the engine of growth and innovation and prosperity is competition. And competition provides the best guarantee that people, customers, clients will not be deceived by uh, the producers of the product. So my comment um, concludes with this idea that we should perhaps focus more on how to achieve a quality monetary system. Uh, what actually prevents the, act, the present system from performing better? Uh, just one or two ideas, because I saw in the first presentation uh, pictures and statistics uh, showing the uh, capital adequacy ratio and so on. I would like to remind that one century ago, the banking system was more was heavily ha capitalized. Uh, the capital ratio was around 50 percent from bank assets in the United States, and still we had the big, the Great Depression. So, not not a single statistical tool or instrument is sufficient and not, not a whole set of statistics is sufficient to cover or to show the soundness, the quality of a financial system. And I will, I will, I will prefer to address the fundamental causes of financial inst instability before uh, proceeding with solutions. What can we do politically or what can we do economically in order to solve a particular question, uh, issue? My question, which is very short now, is what if a country like Romania decides to um, open its borders to uh, freely circulation of euro without joining the, uh, the euro area? Uh, would you consider such a step as a wise measure or you will disapprove it? Because uh, my country, perhaps many other countries in Europe, are heavily euroized or dollarized. So uh, perhaps intuitively at least, if we could allow the free circulation of euro together with the national currency and maybe some other currencies, I don't know, maybe we will discover that in a couple of months all the economy will be euroized and therefore we will have a de facto, we will be in a de facto currency union without deciding politically so. So you will more likely disagree or agree with such kind of measure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please start. <laughs> I'm, I'm again uh, asked to start. First of all, on your comment, which I found interesting, we are far away from hyperinflation in the euro area, by the way. Um, far away from hyperinflation, we are having no inflation almost. Um, the, um, I see your point and that's a very good uh, field for research and I encourage you to, to think about that as much as you can and if you want to interact with our researchers, I here with invite you to do so. Uh, nevertheless, the comparison of the United States 50 years ago with today is not in every respect that easy and uh, but you know to work on a quality monetary system and the soundness of that is worth everybody's time with regard to your question uh, to open Romania or any other country for that matter for a free circulation of the euro from our point of view we're an open economy and uh, 
and uh, you could use our currency all day and all night long um, if you want. Uh, uh, you know, you're, we're very happy. Other countries doing that are doing that. Switzerland is doing that. To give you maybe another example, and uh, it depends on the risks you incur if your banking system starts doing loans in euro. Then we, uh, you have to think through what kind of risks you are incurring, uh, like the risks we incurred by using Swiss francs uh, uh, in lending. Uh, but that is something for you and Romania to decide, not for us. But uh, I think the question which is lying behind your question is uh, how much openness should an economy have in fiscal terms? And uh, Germany is not a small country but a very open economy, and you can guess my answer to that question then very easily. So regarding your comment regarding the financial stability, and please not to rely only on one indicator, I'm going to answer probably in more in broader way. First of all, I, I fully understand that if someone talks about financial stability, and I mentioned financial stability several times during my presentations, Definitely, we shouldn't evaluate financial stability just based on one, one data indicator, for example, as it used to be on um, capital requirements. So I'm very pleased that Basel Committee and Andreas is a member of Basel Committee has come with several other indicators like liquidity ratios, net stable funding ratio, leverage, leverage ratio, exactly. There is a revision of large exposure, standardized approaches under revision, etc. So I am very pleased that now, and I hope that, I mean, all bankers, all economists, they, they know that definitely we should look at the financial stability from a broader perspective. So never, never never look at the financial stability just from one angle. It's really impossible. And back to your question, still based with the financial stability, I think that we should say what really it means to have financial stability. Definitely it doesn't mean that one or two or even more institutions can go bust. They can go bust, but we have to make sure that even if there is one institution or two or even more go in a bankruptcy, it will not mean make the whole financial system ineffective or it must be without any interruption or disruptions of the whole financial systems. So as we are saying, the, we, we, we see financial stability. I don't want to really increase moral hazard and to say there is no institutions even too big to fail, which will fail. No, I just want to see that all institutions are ready and they do have in place a recovery first and after the resolution plans. So I just want to make sure that the public money stay outside the system to make sure that if one institution go bust, well, the financial will go on. This is the financial stability, yes. how, we, how we really identify it. And back to your questions regarding your Can I add one sentence? Sure, please. And if I may, I fully agree with Vladimir. And to be very clear, it is not the task of a central bank to make sure that no bank ever go bust. Like in any, any market, if you have an unconvincing business model, you will have and should exit the market. The question is, just as Vladimir says, what kind of spillover effects does this have to the entire system? We are not the ones who have to guarantee that there is one part of the economy where no participant ever can go bust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And regarding euroization, honestly, why some countries are in favor of one side, euroization, dollarization, etc. Probably they need to buy, I would say, something as a trust from other central banks, from other economic situation. And as a central banker, honestly, it can be advantage, but on the other hand, you have to be sure there are also disadvantages because if you rely on trust, I mean, from other countries, from other central banks, and it was already said, are you sure that you are going to have a powers to really influence your domestic economic situation? If your domestic, I mean, agency, agent, I mean, is, is really relying on euroization, dollarization? Definitely not. Because 
Well, there will be no impact if you, I mean, increase or cut interest rates. And can you think what will happen if you have a huge FX loss, FX exposure? So as I said, definitely as a central banker, it seems to me always have to think about advantages as well as disadvantages. And one side, euroizations, it means that you are accepting another currency without any, without having any powers to do your independent monetary policy regarding the interest rates, regarding FX intervention if you need, or regarding your banking supervision, because it's very difficult to really manage the situation once you have open FX position. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. All right, we have three questions. Dr. Triska, oh, all right, all right, you start first. And then two questions will follow. So you, you do, please ask your question. And my name is Charles Ross, European Anti-Corruption Center. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very lucid and superb pair of presentations in sync. I like to say it takes a little vision to see the needs of the future and to know the answers today. And you have bravely presented some of those answers. Thank you. The issue comes up, obviously, the effective diversification of financial instruments available in Europe. As the European Commission has pointed out, only 99% of all businesses in Europe are SMEs, and the number in North America has been also in the upper 90s for a half a century. Professor, you pointed out that there is a need to identify the low-hanging fruit in such a process of creating an environment which reduces the impact on consumer activity. And indeed, this ultimately becomes the measurement stick for success in economic policy formation and its implementation. I'd like to ask you both, gentlemen, please, to try to identify what are some of those low-hanging fruit, because indeed, we're talking about the politics of the economics of global strategic planning. You have pointed out that the effects of these policies in Europe have global implications. And I'd like to suggest that the problems we see in Greece, the problems we see in the Ukraine, in the long term, accession and implementation of these cultures into stable global monetary policy depends upon choosing the correct low-hanging fruit in the proper order. Thank you. Well, okay, I'm going to start, but honestly, I, I really don't know how to handle your questions. If you are asking me what I can imagine regarding the global international points, what will be the impact on consumer finance on small medium enterprises, if it's correct? Yeah. Well, I'm here as a central banker, and I'm going to use what was said by Andreas, that he's a chief supervisor in Germany, so I'm here as a chief supervisor in the Czech Republic, so my role is to do everything to say that Czech financial sector is stable, and stable it means what I just explained in my previous answers, that it doesn't mean that all financial institutions, I mean, are perfectly healthy, and they can't go past. They, no, nothing like that. Financial stability means that we are ready to do everything that, I mean, tomorrow all payment system will go on, etc. If someone invested, I mean, money in wrong way, we can withdraw license, etc. So why I'm saying that? Because my role is to really contribute regarding preparation of regulation and to supervise that all regulation are put in place to make sure that the whole financial sector is going to be stable, not only in one week, but also in one year and in the long decades. And why I'm saying that? Because this is the key, I mean, role to provide trust for the long-run investment. Because once we are talking about investment, we don't talk about one quarter, two quarters, about one year. We are talking about five-year business cycle, about 10-year business cycle. And, you know, it really means that banking system is here to transfer maturity from deposits, which are usually, I would say, current deposits or one-year deposits, to long-run loans, long-run investment. 
and who is going to mature or to, to transfer maturity from one year to 10 year investment, 15, 20 years? Only if someone trusts that there is going to be a stable financial, inst I mean, institutions for an established, um, stable financial environment. This is the key role, and this is the way, this is the, the my, this is my, my most important thing that I'm going to do, to do everything that people, stakeholders, investors are going to try and find to take, I mean, their money and invest in the banks, invest in the asset companies, invest wherever they want, in pension system, insurance system, and to make it more stable and attractive for stable investors. It doesn't mean we are going to increase, I would say, uh, ratio for returns, nothing like that. We are not venture capital. The role is to do all policies, economic or politics, to make the system stable. This is what I can answer. Yeah, many good things have been said, so I can be uh, short. <laughs> um, now, when Vladimir talks about financial stability, you can also turn it around. And a, a central banker normally thinks about vulnerabilities, which would be a threat to financial stability. Now, and there are two classical vulnerabilities um, 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 which are clear, they are micro and they are macro. And the micro um, uh, uh, prudential vulnerabilities no longer only refer to banks, but they also refer to insurance companies, they refer to marketplaces and stock exchanges, they refer to central counterparties. You have to think much broader these days in terms of vulnerabilities. And the second, so that keeps me up at night, uh, thinking about where are the vulnerabilities uh, in those areas and uh, from a macro perspective. Uh, the other macro question, uh, which is very important, of course, is where, especially in a low interest rate environment, uh, with a lot of liquidity we're still having, um, where are areas where bubbles can build up? And they can be extremely dangerous, as we all know. Uh, again, especially in a uh, cocktail of a market environment which has low inflation, low interest rates, rather high liquidity and rather low volatility. That's the area we're in. And if you think about that, uh, you of course have to think through could there be a bubble in the residential real estate market? Could there be a bubble in the commercial real estate market? Where are the big asset classes? And uh, you know, that's, these are the things uh, to turn Vladimir's good argument about financial stability around. And that's what we are thinking about. Um, but they are not low hanging fruit. They are pretty high hanging. So, uh, but they are the ones which make us, uh, which make us discuss. We have less than five minutes left, so there is time for two more questions. Professor Diba first. Thank you. So, we have five minutes, so, so <laughs> the question has to be very short. Um, uh, you talked, Professor Lombard, you talked uh, about Greece, which, which is uh, maybe low-hanging fruit, in a sense. I hope not. <laughs> of course, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, you know, one, one thing is to have a certain logic in your presentation, which is nice to follow and so on and so forth, but then we have obviously big crisis in the euro area still. still. Uh, you also mentioned, mentioned three, I think, uh, conditions which Greece has to fulfill uh, in order to get more help. This, I'm, this is impossible trinity, it seems to me. <laughs> you asking uh, Greece to, to fulfill. You know, so so um, the issue is whether Greece will stay in Eurozone and get money from the others, yeah. or uh, if there is sort of institutional change, 
and a possibility to get out of Eurozone, do some homework and eventually get back in. How would you see it is? I think it would help many things inside of Europe, Eurozone and so on, to have a kind of flexible Eurozone. All right, and very last question, Dr. Tríska, and then we will wrap up. Mm, my question is, firstly, shouldn't the regulator in the industry, as heavily regulated as the financial services, uh, be accountable or liable for the outcomes of regulation? Like, you know, you clean your hands that we are not responsible for banks going bust, but I think you should care and should be accountable and liable very often. My second question is more fundamental, still more fundamental, and this is uh, me in the position of the Deputy Minister of Finance in the early 90s in the country, Deputy of Václav Klaus. Uh, I was strongly and devotedly investigated the concept of universal know-how in the realm of financial services regulation. And I realized, I realized there is no such thing. So if you ask for harmonization, you know, what system would you take, you know, as an example, uh, as, as, as a pattern. And in this sense, I, of, of course, I'm a strong promoter of just the contrary concept of competition of regulators. Thank you. Thank you very much. And final I stop? questions and, and final okay. remarks, please. Okay, I'll be quick because we have a little time. Our first question with the Eurozone and Greece, it is not in our interest and it can be in nobody's interest to ask for conditions the country cannot fulfill. Because then we are just pushing the problem ahead, kicking the can down the road, so to say, and that won't help. So that's not, that's not, a, that, that's not a smart solution. Yeah, and that's, uh, we have been already five years uh, um, on, our, on our clock, so to say. So, uh, so it's not in our interest, shouldn't be in anybody's interest, just to, um, to kick the can down the road. Now, with regard to Greece, let me be very honest. Greece has exactly three possibilities. Assuming that Greece needs money from the outside because they cannot go to the capital markets or anywhere else to get the money. The first option is Greece extends the existing program with the Troika. I know it's now named differently, but for simplicity reasons, I call it the Troika. The second option is they negotiate and agree on a new program. The third option is no program. Nobody is negotiating on the third option. Everybody is trying to make this work. But again, uh, without conditions, you won't get there. And uh, I have no idea what the outcome of this will be, but I know it's five to midnight and it's uh, very close to the finishing line of this. So, um, but it's in no interest, not in the Greek interest and not in the Eurozone interest to have a solution which overburdens either the European Union, and you are a member of, of that, or the Eurozone or Greece. So it has to be a compromise. With regard, should regulators be accountable or liable for the outcome of regulation? I think they are, because uh, um, I am on the Basel Committee, I'm a member of the Financial Stability Board, I'm actually right now the European head of the Financial Stability Board until the end of this month, so not much longer. My liability is going away, but uh, I am uh, also in the G20, I'm a member of the, I'm the deputy of the G7, etc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. So we are we are liable. I know I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Now, uh, why don't we start with the accountants? Right now we have a situation that an accountant is not liable for his proof and testament 
under the balance sheet. I think that is, if you want to, you know, and there should be, a, you know, whereas bankers should be accountable for their actions, that's why I would start. But then also auditors, and then uh, should be liable for their audits, at least to some extent, for gross uh, neglect. And regulators have a different, um, if I may say so, in all sincerity. Regulators are different from bankers and from auditors. A banker, and I've been a banker for a very long time, the banker caters the following constituencies. A banker caters his customers, his employees, his shareholders, and his clients. A regulator has one constituency, which is the public good, to make sure the taxpayers' monies are safe. Uh, so you cannot make somebody financially accountable and liable who has to protect in the long term the taxpayers money that's a, that's not a profit organization you know it's not meant to make profit but it's meant to protect and make the system more stable your second question was the harmonization what system would one take as a pattern what would be the benchmark now, in the euro area at least, I have no benchmark. And I can tell you, it's for sure not Germany. Uh, the good thing about the banking union and the single supervisory mechanism, I think, is that we can learn from each other in the joint teams that in some aspects, German bank supervision, for example, in the fit and proper decision making, is very good. In others, we are pretty poor. We produced all sorts of banking problems in Germany. So I can learn from the Spanish or from the Greek or from the, uh, uh, from the uh, French. Uh, and the, the idea is, through harmonization, to find a new model, which is not a national model, but it's a mix of several models. And that's why I think the strength could be. Vladimir, please briefly your, your remarks. Yeah, yeah, very briefly, two or three sentences. Regarding the Greeks, I think it's fair to say that it doesn't matter what way Greece will go. We can expect that even if you choose one or the second or the third row, there is no free lunch for the future. So you always have to think, even if you go this or that way, you always have to pay for the future. And all of us, are, including I mean, Greek people, they have to realize that. Regarding accountability, I think it was perfectly explained by Andreas. And I would just I mean pointing out one thing. I mean, and people usually they don't they don't see that there is a difference between regulators and supervisors. So it's very difficult to say that supervisors are responsible for some bankruptcy, etc. That's why at least we have separated the role. Someone is preparing regulation, which must be approved usually by national parliaments, etc. And there is another body supervisor. They they run the supervision. Yeah, and of course it has some other consequences for national taxpayers, etc. This is another issue. Finally, I have already said that during my presentations that I have been always advocating to harmonize at least some minimum standards. If someone wants to be more prudent and to address some special national features, go ahead. But at least to have the same level playing field at minimum standards to make sure because, I mean, capital is highly volatile. It can go quickly from one country to another. So we have to see, we do have some harmonization in minimum capital standards in leverage ratios, etc. But as I said, if someone feels there is some danger, there is some threat, and he's responsible for regulator as a supervisor, go ahead to increase the minimum standards, but at least to harmonize something. Thanks for that. Andreas, Vladimir, thank you for being here with us, and I hope you will come again to Severo Institute. Thank you. Thank you. And you who want to debate the challenges uh, to monetary policy, come to the Czech National Bank on Monday, 5 at uh, 30 p.m. we have this wonderful conference on cryptocurrencies. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.